Um, this is my first time on the campus. I have enjoyed seeing the campus, meeting faculty, hearing about the work here. Um, and um, so I thought that what I would do to kick the panel off is just to share some things about Spencer for those of you that don't know what Spencer does. And I know sometimes when I go around and with this hat on, people are thinking about where are the resources that might be able to fund my work. So I'll do a, a little bit of an overview of what we do so you'll know how to locate yourself there. And then we're going to have a, a conversation, a more specific conversation, kind of about how we think about funding for equity work and um, work on race in particular. That's my, my background. So this is an interesting kind of coming together of these little worlds that I have sometimes separately and sometimes they intersect. Um, it's actually been really interesting being in this position as a scholar of race. Um, first, because when I got appointed, the whole world was surprised. <laughs> they were like, wait, what? Are you? Um, I didn't take that personally. I took that to me, wow, what a progressive move for a foundation like the Spencer Foundation to hire someone who is not only a black woman, but a race scholar. And what does that mean for where our field might be headed? What, where is it, what does that mean for the kinds of work that gets included under the tent now? So I've been thinking a lot about what that means for the organization that the board hired me, what was the work they wanted me to do, and what's the work there's the appetite for, and how to push the appetite. Um, but let me start with just a little bit about what Spencer is. So Spencer is a private foundation. We fund education research. I'm super grateful about our narrow focus because my peers who run big blocky foundations have to figure out how to fix all the problems of the world and we only think about this tiny little bucket of things um, in education research. So we fund research. We have a number of programs for you know, direct um, funding of research projects. We fund research training. Um, so we have a couple of really um, high quality training programs, our dissertation fellowship program, our postdoctoral fellowship program. Um, and we think a lot about broadening diversity along a number of dimensions. So broadening the diversity of the people we fund, the scholars we fund, broadening diversity among the institutions that we fund. Um, and then thinking about what, how is it that our funding supports the creation and spread of new great ideas. What you know about ideas is that the more different perspectives you have in a field or in a room, the better and more high quality the ideas are. Um, and so we also have a couple of new kind of, so that's the historical what we've done as a foundation. We have a couple of new goals with our um, kind of refresh to strategy that we launched about a month ago. One of those goals is about supporting scholars in increasing the level of impact for their work to policy and practice. So we did this kind of tour of the world. Um, and <coughs> this was actually one of, the, one of the 40 sites we visited. We visited 40 different schools of education. Um, and um, we met with a bunch of people at ARA. We um, launched a survey which got about 1,100 responses. And we heard a few things. One of the things we heard is that scholars want their research to matter and to help improve the world. And this was like, like we say it all dry like that, but it was like an angst among scholars in our field. This idea that here we are at Ivy Tower doing this research and the world is troubled. And how does the work we're doing matter to um, solve some of the problems of education in the world? We heard that folks are really worried about this disconnect research policy and practice, and a sense that that disconnect has grown greater over time. We heard that scholars want more time to think together and work collaboratively. This we heard again and again and again. Every place that we went, folks were like, I'm just I'm too busy and I'm too tired to really have time to think. <coughs> to think, much less to think with my colleagues and with my students. Um, and we heard again and again and again that scholars want to help think about how we as a field respond to the progressive inequalities in education and in the world. And so we kind of took that information back to the foundation and thought about what it is that we're going to do differently. This is just our, I love these little pictures. Can I just tell you what you um, This is our kind of matrix around what our commitments are with our funding, right? So we fund research that is rigorous. We fund research that is relevant, which means touching on the most pressing questions and opportunities in education. 
We fund, uh, we do work and fund in a way that is equitable, and I'll say more about how that equity work has hit, not just the kind of topics that we consider, but the way we fund, which is super important. Um, we fund work that is transformative and collaborative. So those are kind of the values that underlie our funding and our internal processes and center um, So I think I'll just talk through this one a little bit and then talk a little bit more about the equity work and then we'll put it up to the count. Um, so we changed some things. You'll see it. I think we had brochures going around or there's somewhere in the room um, at the back. That didn't talk about the, so we have one that talks about our kind of change process and what we did, but then we have one that just says, here's what we fund. So there's a whole thing with details about all the programs, and that's what we're interested in. Um, we created some new programs, professional programs, including our research practice partnership program, which is a funding opportunity of $400,000 to work in collaboration with practitioners of some sort. That could be a school district, that could be community-based organizations, that could be higher ed institutions, um, but working collaboratively to solve some important issue or problem in the world. Um, and we also started, uh, I'm gonna pick up these, yeah, probably all these actually really be on our equity work. We also thought, so Spencer's field initiated, that's really important, it's a really important part of our history and, and commitment to say, we fund the great ideas scholars bring to us from across the field. So if you're a philosopher, a historian, a computer scientist, we fund all of it. And it felt like, there is an important need to go deeply in a focused way on some key topics, and inequality will be one of those topics for us moving forward. Um, we also have been thinking a lot about how we fund, like how we how we do our work, um, and thinking about, you know, given my background in equity and inclusion, how to make sure that our internal processes weren't reproducing cycles of privilege. Right? And it's one of the things I think that if I could be completely candid, even though know, the camera's on, I don't think it's a secret. Um, Spencer has had a reputation of being a little bit of a black box and a little bit of a closed network. Right? And so we're wanting in this space to think about how we open that network and create more transparency about what we do and how we do it. And that's meant several things. Probably the most important thing is that we were doing these field engagement visits last year and in every, just about every one, you know how when you're doing a spiel, like certain, certain questions come up. So we do our spiel and one of the questions that comes up is, you know, I submitted a proposal, I got a rejection, and I never got any feedback about why. And so you have your canned response to the question that comes up every time. And our canned response was, yes, we understand. We're sorry we can't get feedback. We have a small staff, there's only six program staff, and we're unable to get feedback, specific feedback on the full range of proposals that come to the door. And so we had done three or four of these conversations where that had come up and we gave a canned response and people kind of nodded and moved on. And then we were in this one group and we, I gave the canned response, and they were like, yeah, no, that's, that's not good enough. And I was like, oh. They were like, actually, we take a lot, we understand you have limited time, but you have more time and resources than we have. We take a lot of time to put a proposal together. You could be, you should, you should be able to give feedback. And if you're saying that you don't, that's a statement of your values. And I was like, Whoa. <laughs> And it was like this moment of like, that, that person, Absolutely right. And so we are moving with all of the new competitions, so the ones that start this summer, to 100% feedback for proposals. And, and what's interesting about that is that has up, so, so that's an equity move for us, right? That's a move to say, if you, if you only give feedback to the top 30% of proposals, which is about what we were doing, then you're giving feedback to the people who have the strongest skill set to begin with, right? And folks who are further from the mark you're not actually helping to build their capacity. And, and in that way, our role was as an evaluator. We're the people who are saying what's good enough or not. And what we decided is that we want our role to be um, as, a, as a developer of high quality research and of high quality research proposals. And if we see ourselves as being in the business of scaffolding, supporting, teaching, then that feedback work is actually just a part of it. So we've redesigned all of our um, all of our process, processes, expanded our review panels. Um, it's, it's it's pretty incredible how many people now are touching the work, um, touching each proposal as it goes through, and um, and we'll, we'll move to this model of giving feedback the same way that journal articles like, that journals do when you submit an article, so you always get something. 
Um, but that's meant something else that I think is also a part of our equity work. That's meant that we also are expanding the number of people who review proposals for us, which is in and of itself a professional development opportunity. Right? So because when you review proposals, you get a sense of, oh, this is what a strong proposal looks like. And if you don't have naturally already like those networks, that window in is, is a really important professional development opportunity. So we're super proud of this. We hope it works. Um, some folks have said, well, you're going <laughs> to use up all the capacity in the field. We hope that doesn't happen. So we'll keep our eye on, like, are we exhausting people with these review requests? So if you get a request to review a proposal, <laughs> that's where that's coming from. Um, at the same time, we've been thinking a lot about um, institutional diversity, because Spencer actually does relatively well around racial, ethnic, gender, um, sexual orientation, probably less well around disability status. But we do decently well on some of the more classic metrics of, um, of diversity. But we don't do so well on institutional diversity, which means we are funding many of the same institutions, predominantly R1. And so we've been thinking a lot about why that is and what we can do um, to expand the pool of universities that gain access to Spencer resources. Um, and that has included so far really just reaching out more. We have this, this elaborate list of which universities have submitted proposals and have been funded, or which universities have submitted a lot of proposals but have not been funded, which universities haven't submitted at all, and we're kind of strategically going out to those places, talking to people, doing workshops on preparing grant proposals and trying to just get the, um, get the information out there. Um, and maybe the, the final thing I'll talk about before we open it up is that um, we've been working on this new initiative that we're calling Cultivating Equitable Education Spaces. And so for us, these initiatives are a way to broaden and deepen. So in addition to the field initiated funding, we are saying there are a few key topics in our era that we want to really go deep on. Inequality is one of them. And not just inequality in terms of describing how bad it is, because we know it's bad, it's important to know the contours of the parliaments, but it's also important to think about how we respond and what we can do to support what equitable education spaces look like. So this initiative is have, will have several components. One is just, well, the first thing is probably figuring out under that really broad umbrella, what are the topics that are both important and um, could gain traction in the world beyond just the academy? The second is figuring out what we know about those topics. So one of the things that's occurred to me in thinking about this disconnect between policy and practice is that it is not incredibly useful for policymakers or practitioners to hear about the findings from one study. What policymakers and practitioners need to know is what do we know? Like not what do you know, but what do we know as a field about a thing? So we'll be doing some white papers and syntheses across some areas to say, what do we know about this thing? And then some agenda setting. What do we need to know? What do we not know that would actually be really critical for impact in policy and practice? And then thinking about how to have a conversation about that, what do we not know, that's not just researchers sitting alone, but that also includes policymakers and practitioners. And then the fourth, the, the, the final part of the initiatives, I think, is thinking about then how do we impact the public conversation about education, which is pretty reductive in, in a worrisome way. <laughs> and so thinking about how we work with networks of journalists, how we support scholars, in, in getting their work out into the world, how, how, what can we do at the foundation to help shift and broaden and deepen and enrich, in the, public, and enrich the public conversation about education? Um, and um, someone asked me earlier today if, because there are four initiative topics, the inequality is one of them, and someone asked if those will guide kind of our funding priorities. And I think the answer to that is both yes and no. I think on the one hand, we see ourselves as, as helping the field set some agendas that then, of course, will be invested in funding as they, as they move forward. On the other hand, there won't be like quotas in any of the funding programs about what the topics are. That's just kind of not, not what we do. But I think we are seeing ourselves as wanting to build new kinds of capacity in the field in a really focused way. So I will stop there. And thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this <coughs> sunny spring day. It seems like spring has finally made it. Hopefully it doesn't go anywhere. Um, 
I'm a member of the Diversity, Equity, and Multicultural Education Committee, um, and I'm here to moderate the panel that's centered on researching race and inequity in education. So our distinguished guest, Dr. Nasir from the Spencer Foundation, has already discussed some important <coughs> points related to this topic as part of what Dr. Wilton said, the Dean's Diversity Lecture Series. Um, so in addition to Dr. Nasir, our own Drs. Allen, Burton, Dr. Spann, and Trent will provide insight um, on various related topics as well. So many of today's panelists wear multiple hats around this campus, uh, but in light of our discussion's focus this afternoon, they'll speak from their research focus roles more so. Um, so in addition to Dr. Nasir, we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Antoinette Burton, who is a historian of modern British imperialism with an emphasis on feminist and anti-racist methods. Her work has been supported by the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and um, the Guggenheim Foundation. She has been the director of the Illinois Program for Research in the Humanities since 2015. Dr. William Trent, our own, um, joined the Department of Education Policy Studies, which is now EPOL, um, Education Policy Organization and Leadership in 1983. He received his PhD in sociology from the University of, of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And Dr. Trent's research centers on educational inequality, fitting, of course. And he's held multiple research appointments, um, including at the Center for the Education for Education Policy at Duke University and the Center for the Social Organization of Schools at the Johns Hopkins University. Um, in 1995, he was also a visiting scholar at the Education Policy Unit um, at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa. From 2000, excuse me, from 1995 to 2000, he served as an associate chancellor here, here at Illinois. Dr. Gabrielle Allen, um, who is the Dean for Research and Director of the Bureau of Educational Research here at the College of Education, um, she's also a professor of curriculum and instruction, astronomy, and computer science. Previously, as a director for research at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, she worked to develop research <coughs> connections across the university, built up programs to engage faculty, postdoctoral researchers, and students, and established a set of thematic areas targeted around solving grand challenge problems with the with the social and with social and scientific impact, Dr. Allen holds graduate degrees um, in physics and in theoretical uh, physics and applied mathematics from Cambridge University. Dr. Christopher Spann, last but not least, uh, received his PhD from here, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, in 2001. He's the associate dean for graduate programs in the College of Education as an associate professor in the Department of educational policy, organization, and leadership um, here at UIUC. So as far as structure for the next uh, 40 or so minutes, um, the panel will spend about that much time, about 40 minutes, responding to questions that the DEMI committee generated. Um, we've drafted four questions, so we're hoping to spend about 10 minutes on each. Questions will appear on the screen behind me. And I kindly request that the panelists limit their responses to three minutes each so we can, uh, we can address most, if not all, questions. And at the point that the panelists finish responding to our generated questions, we'll open it up to the floor for you all to pose questions to them as well. So our first question here. Sorry, panelists. Um, so, panelists, distinguished panelists. Can you all share some research initiatives you've been involved in that address race and inequity in education? Research both uh, a variety of kinds of research that would inform us about the various benefits associated with 
this source of enabling students to complete their uh, college educations and enabling parent students into the PhD. Uh, we have had at least three Gates Millennium Scholars complete their doctorate or are in the process of completing their doctorate here at the University of Illinois. Uh, the members of the community serve in terms of race, uh, on each, in terms of race specifically, for African American students, Latinx, uh, Native American, and Asian American students. It was a fascinating project. We got to build all of the research from the top to bottom. I can think of a couple things that, that I've been involved with. In some ways, uh, the building the field work that people like Trent will use in their research around these funded projects with McNair and SRLP, working closely with undergraduate students from underrepresented backgrounds, uh, inspiring to have research experience so they could go on to graduate school and be part of the pipeline of research that Trent's talking about. Uh, the same with working with graduate students through SPI, um, Summer uh, uh, Pre-Doctoral Institute, or the Spencer, uh, or the First Fine Faculty in Illinois Fellowship, working closely with them. See my colleague in the back, Dr. Pock and I, we've written on uh, how a department like our Department of Education and Policy Organization Leadership institutionalized diversity in the 30-year effort to achieve that outcome. And I also worked with Jim Anderson and a few others um, on our campus. We were about 50 odd historians who were part of an amicus brief for uh, the merit decision uh, that would be heard by the uh, Supreme Court, uh, I believe in 2007, if I'm not mistaken, in that regard. So those are some of the things that, that we've worked with in that regard, so in different capacities. Um, so I thought I'd just speak briefly about um, my role as director of the Humanities Center here on campus, um, which uh, one of our main functions is to support research for faculty and graduate students. And in that capacity, I work very hard to make sure that um, questions of diversity and equity are central to the fellows that we choose, to the programs that we run, um, to the capacity building to which you referred that we're involved in. And this past year, um, we decided to uh, make our annual theme race work so that we could expressly call out and um, feature the work of faculty and graduate students in and around subjects that fall under that rubric. And we have um, a number of fellows in a, in a seminar that meets regularly, and we had lots of programming to feature all kinds of different race work. That was the public part. I guess I would say the behind the scenes part is that I've um, been working with a graduate student to circulate around campus and interview people in a variety of departments to see exactly where research on race and uh, diversity and equity and access is happening. And so I think we don't have the results of that completely, but I think um, making sure that we assess and keep track and make available knowledge um, behind the scenes as important as what we do kind of publicly. Yeah, I was trying to think about a good, um, good example. I feel like I've done work on race for much of my career, but I was trying to think about like big scope things, and what occurred to me was the center, it actually never became a center, but at a certain point NSF was funding science and learning centers, and they, get, they did a few, um, you call them like the grants to get a grant ready. Plenty of grants. Thank you. That kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and so we had a planning grant. Um, I want to say we, I mean, Carol Lee, Beth Warren, and Chris Gutierrez, um, to design a center that was around understanding learning and development but from a cultural perspective. And what I really appreciate, uh, there's several things I appreciate now looking back on that effort. One is that the work in that on race was integral to the science, right? That it wasn't overlaid on top of the science. The <laughs> assumption was that if you were going to really understand the nature of learning and development, you needed to understand how those, how that as a, how those processes were fundamentally racialized and cultural. And so that, that it wasn't to understand the experience of some people in learning environments, but rather to say, 
all learning environments are organized with respect to basic culture. And so if you're going to understand learning and what it is, then you need to understand those aspects of it. And so that's one thing I appreciated about, about it, was not having the race part of the work be external to the science, but having it be actually a part of the science, which is to say, if you don't have a theory of learning that accounts for racial and cultural processes, you don't have a good theory of learning. Um, the second part of what I really appreciated about that work was that it was this amazing intergenerational set of scholars who brought different kinds of expertise to the table, and part of the work was figuring out how we talk to one another, so how the quantitative methodologists talk to the people who were doing really deep case studies of learning and informal learning settings, and, and, and what kinds of theory construction or question construction we could do together. And I think for me, it's that kind of um, collaborative effort that builds beyond what any one research group or research team can do that is where the real kind of fun, meaty work is. Okay, so our next question um, sort of is in conversation with some of the things that you uh, highlighted in your presentation, Dr. Nasir. We're interested in what you all can say about um, what are some key advancements or trends in research on race and equity in education, and what research is needed to further advance the field from where you all sit. I guess I'll start on this one because there's there's a few things that I jotted down as I was thinking about this question. Um, one, we need kind of have a to have a greater uh, push for diversity and inclusion in higher education and the workplace. So we we know the language is there, but our lived experiences don't always match the language. And so and there's no real scaffold or plan as to how that plays itself out. So getting uh, individuals who have excellent intentions, but not necessarily direction, and thinking through what that actually means. I think that will go a long way, because um, it can trickle both up to senior leadership as well as down to students. Um, another is thinking about where are the areas where we have some of the greatest, most glaring examples of educational underachievement. So I think about our Native American population, like just here in Illinois, they represent less than 1% of our student body. Um, we had imagery that you know represents, we, we know more about the image of a Native American, the experiences of Native Americans. And so how do we help people rethink that process and what does it look like? How do we identify a pipeline uh, to be built and scaffold it out and then uh, work through what are the mechanisms and resources that are tied to it? Uh, but it's very intentional is what I'm saying. Um, I also think of the work of people like the journalists out of the New York Times, Nicole Hannah Jones, and really that groundbreaking research they did around resegregation of Jefferson County, Alabama, and how the decision-making processes of everyday people were shaping education policy, how those who had a little bit more power resources shifted it to their advantage, even how the courts upheld it, but yet at the same time, try to rely on traditional precedent, and what role does social science evidence really serve as the foundation for kind of equity and access uh, within these judicial decisions, and how we can play an important role for this kind of social change. And I think the last thing that I would point to is uh, kind of what Dr. Nasir had pointed to, that we need to scaffold uh, uh, ideas and opportunities to build the kind of capacity we want, so we can spread this work, this diversity work around, that it's not just a handful of people doing it, but you're training more people to do it in more diverse ways to hopefully remedy more problems uh, in the same amount of time. So how we think about that, I think, would be some of the uh, key trends in where I'd like to see it. Picking up on that and also the, uh, the comments about uh, impact, and I think one of the things that we need to look at more is how to do more applied and use inspired research in this area. As you heard, I'm also a professor of astronomy and there, we, all of our research is, is, is applied, and we're able to construct large, grand challenge problem that a whole community will target. And I think we need to think how to do that within education, so that we are really thinking about how to, how to embed this kind of research more around race and equity and the other educational topics, so it's part of the institutions, part of, our, part of the culture of research and part of what we do in research groups. And I think part of understanding how to do that is going to be 
um, doing more research on how to motivate people and how to, how to reward people in the right way to do the extra work that, that might need to be done to think about it, equity and inclusion and, and diversity more. The National Science Foundation has a program on the science of team science and where they start to look at a lot of these sort of social issues of how do you build and support teams and I think that's something that we should also be looking at along the, the, the race and equity as, aspect. And things like what is the what does it mean if we do collaborative and interdisciplinary science that was, was mentioned? Does that provide more opportunities for equity? Does, does that help? Are those techniques uh, useful in terms of building the kinds of teams and research that we want to see? Dr. Adam, do you mind clarifying? Uh, we spoke earlier trying to make sure that we were on the same page about um, what grand challenge problems are, because I feel like that sure, applies so here, but non <laughs> like we may not know. So in, in, the, um, in the engineering and science part of the campus, we typically talk about grand challenge problems, and that was a, 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 a term that came up from the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. And there's a set of problems, like the problem that has motivated my work for, um, uh, for, for many decades is what happens when two black holes collide together. And that's been a grand challenge problem that the National Science Foundation invested over a billion dollars in building gravitational wave detectors. We have a community of a couple of thousand of scientists all working on different aspects of this, this problem. And you might have seen a couple of years ago that, that we discovered gravitational waves and there was a big news, but this was really the, 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 the whole program that for years was building towards this. I've thought about this a lot, trying to understand what are the grand challenge problems in education. And I, and I kind of feel that the problems are even bigger than grand challenge problems because they're so complicated, so huge, that in education we need to think how to simplify things down to a grand challenge problem. Something that we could, we could do with a community in a 20 year time scale with $50 million of funding, say. Um, and also something that needs infrastructure. Um, it's another thing, grand challenge uh, problems, usually you build a telescope, you build a, 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 an MRI or, or some kind of big infrastructure and, it, and another thing is in education we, we don't have those infrastructures around and I think that's another thing that we should be looking at in how to make sure that we have infrastructure that not only supports the research but also acts as a collaborative tool to bring people together around a single problem that can be solved um, with a with a big vision. I, I actually listed several things and I'll start with the one that, that, that in one sense, enables the research and scholarship we do. And, and, and that is in part the technology, the speed with which we can do complex analyses now, and the modeling that we can do as a result in terms of our statistical modeling certainly does benefit the uh, front side of our communities. And it's enabled us to do uh, the kind of research that practitioners want to see in terms of uh, estimating causal effects in a more uh, in a more valued and, and demonstrable way and a trustworthy way. So I'll start there. Theoretically, I think the research guided by critical race theory, intersectionality, and identity theory has helped us recast how we think about many of the students who reside in those categories who need attention. Uh, in the assessment world, we're seeing a great more focus on Socio-cultural issues that ought to drive our thinking about assessment uh, that would disappear. Uh, but I think I think that, along with the work of uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Bill Selisak, in terms of thinking about non-cognitive factors associated with persistence, I think all of those have helped, helped us recast how we think about the conditions for success, along with focusing on issues of organizational climate and culture. Those are key factors that impact students' success and engagement and participation. Uh, Sylvia Hurtado working on that uh, Gates Millennium Scholars Project along with Walt Allen. Um, it, uh, blocking on Ed's last name. Uh, John Tippaconic. We had a multidisciplinary research committee. We also had a multi-ethnic, multiracial research committee. Many of the best ideas we said late ended up on the cutting floor. Uh, but I think those ways of thinking about and recasting our problems, and I'll put one more there, and that's the way we've begun to rethink uh, community colleges. 
for a long time, the dominant theme was the cooling out process in higher education was associated with community colleges. And colleagues now are uh, using phrases like the heating up process. And I think that's a significant advancement, particularly given the distribution of students of color and high need students in the community colleges. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about this this question of trends and like what's the work we need. I don't know if I have any good answers, but I do agree with you, Bill, that the increase in work that utilizes critical race theory and critical studies perspectives is um, is really encouraging to see, and that work is becoming, I think, more and more um, prevalent. I think I also see a trend around the ways researchers want to work with communities and an increasing kind of methods that are respectful, methods that take community knowledge seriously, <coughs> that reflect uh, an increasing discomfort with being researchers that float into communities, take things out, and then go back to the university. I think that's really encouraging. Um, at, at the same time, I think there's this broader trend in research around new, new kinds of population level data sets. And I'm not seeing folks who study race really, or <laughs> folks who study race well, um, digging into that quantitative work, so I think that's interesting to me to think about. I think there's actually a need for those critical race theories to inform quantitative work, um, and I think there's a fascinating kind of opportunity there. When I think about the research that is needed, I think about what kinds of interdisciplinary teams, interdisciplinary collaborative teams that might be poised to take up some of these big grand challenge type problems, such as you know, you talk about educational inequality, you can't really talk about that without thinking about housing and residential segregation and how, and, and how do we think about those things in relation to one another with housing experts and education experts in the room, just kind of as one example. I think we need work, work that's policy relevant, that just because I, I think there's a, I have a frustration with policymakers, and we're talking about this a bit at lunch, which is that oftentimes people know the policies they want to support and they're just looking for the work to, um, to, verify, to, to verify the perspective they already hold. But were they not to do that, we still wouldn't know how to tell them what to do as a field. <laughs> and so thinking about work that actually has not just, here are all the problems, but here's what we might do to start to address some of these problems. The problem is that's always that's an inherent compromise. Um, I think work that, for me, honors and steps into the ideal role of universities in our society. I think universities have the luxury of thinking and studying on behalf of society, so thinking about how we can encourage an identity on the part of research universities that's about service to the to the world in, in, in this context, particularly to the world of education. And then I think we need work that links kind of micro studies of what happens inside education spaces and kind of macro studies of all of the forces that impinge on that what happens inside to think about the complexity of the terrain and various points of, um, of change levers that are possible. All right, so our next question um, is asking, so from your perspective, perspectives, uh, what are some opportunities and resources that could be used to further advance research in this area? And many of you have sort of spoken to it, but if you could just elaborate, we'd appreciate it. Um, one thing I was thinking about is on this um, on this campus where um, uh, um, equity and diversity is a priority and we just heard about that there was a, a lunchtime talk about the strategic plan. I think there's a, a, a possibility to think about how to incorporate this research into providing guidance to the, to the, the running of the, the university and to again provide this kind of infrastructure that, that we, could, we could perform this research around data on, the, the, on our own campus. We have different um, uh, centres here at the College of Education. We have CREA, the Centre for Culturally Responsive Evaluation and Assessment. We have an emerging um, project, Janus, which is looking at collecting up longitudinal data that's relevant for uh, education. We have a strong interest around data science and computing and machine learning on the campus. So maybe there's a way to think about how to, how to look at some of these issues within our own university and to test out research, do new research that's actually going to provide impact um, in, in the campus itself. Um, that would be my, my suggestion. 
I think it's important as well to build a road set of stone around how we talk about race and equity. And not just, we, we figured it out in some ways for those who have done the research and, and studied the specifics of it. But we have to learn how to write in translatable ways for the larger communities out there. Uh, where race, uh, even though we may talk about it as a construct, it's a very lived, real experience for them. And the way they go about communicating it in their lives. So we have to understand how to make it translatable through a social media standpoint, through their lived experience standpoint, public relations, uh, public policy. We also got to figure out a way to get more PD for our educators, uh, professional development, because they don't have the, the knowledge and the skills and the disposition, or they haven't honed them yet, to really have those meaningful engagement with parents and, and uh, uh, community members and their students. That all have to be working hand in hand to kind of rethink the way we have come to think about these concepts and their impact, particularly the harmful impacts on society. So I think if, if there was a, a way that we can kind of advance our research, that's the area that I'd like to see it go as to how we make this uh, uh, communicated to everyone uh, in similar ways, but different enough that we can begin to still have enough affinity to have direction, but universality to have solutions. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the thing that strikes me is particularly interesting about this particular question is that I really feel that um, increasing research heightens our awareness of the significance of context at the school, neighborhood, local, regional, and national levels. And increasingly we've come to appreciate the interdependence of so many of these factors. And so often when practitioners intervene, we pull one of the levers rather than trying to identify ways in which we could cooperatively pull multiple levers at once in a cooperative fashion to address some of these persisting issues that are deeply embedded. And again, that cross over these micro to macro levels. I think one thing that, that struck me as a potential is, is to find a way to have um, researchers and scholars actually spend more time finding potential ways of addressing some of these issues in our existing research. I don't know that we have fully embraced the findings that we have in a way which would inform us about addressing some of these larger issues in a more complex way. So I think that, that building that, so careful deliberation about current research findings, about the research policy and civic communities could be used to identify strategic investments. So I think that um, we live uh, at Illinois in a self-professedly interdisciplinary institution. Um, we're told often that it's in our DNA. Um, but I think we could probably work um, harder to incentivize genuinely collaborative and cross-disciplinary work along the lines of what my colleagues have said. And I think um, I'm particularly worried about and skeptical of the um, juggernaut of data science and other related um, AI uh, domains of inquiry because I think they um, carry with them an emancipatory rhetoric that in fact papers over um, very familiar grand challenges of racial disparity and inequity and uh, all other kinds of um, structural issues and I think um, this campus and many campuses that are chasing the data science dream um, really need to be um, looking more inward at the resources that we have um, and the research that's already done by critical race theorists and others to think about how we might not reproduce um, the kind of white privilege I think at the heart of data science. And I think that there are a lot of folks on campus who are invested in that, but not a lot of levers, as it were, to pull uh, uh, in order to um, mobilize the resources we need for that. So I, I, get, I maybe approach this question a little differently. Um, I was thinking about 
we have this moment nationally with respect to philanthropy where there are all of these leaders of major foundations that care a lot about inequality. Ford, Education Work at Hewlett, W.T. Grant, Spencer, all of these foundations to some degree fund research. And so I have this um, <coughs> a little bit of a pipe dream um, about what, what happens when you bring the philanthropic community into alignment with itself to set an agenda around funding research. Like what, 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 could, the, what could the power and the outputs be there? Because each of those organizations has a slightly different skill set and community. Um, for instance, WT Grant funds an education, but also more broadly across the social sciences, right? Ford has their, their research funding, but also really deep ties into various communities doing different kinds of work in the world. Like, what happens when you bring those strengths together? Okay, so our final question for the panel. Um, we're just interested in what you all think. So how can scholars and funding agencies work together, to, to your last point, Dr. Nassir, to prioritize research that explicitly centers race and inequity? Um, I uh, spent early parts of my career working in a couple of centers, and I realized that one of the concerns about heavy investment in centers is that it, in certain ways, will shrink the number of voices in the research community that are being funded. So I know that's, a, that's always a hassle, and it works oftentimes to the disadvantage of junior faculty. Nonetheless, I think if we can support and build collaborations that have the potential to yield deeper and broader understandings regarding the scholarship and knowledge base with respect to race and equity, we can again, and it's, it's the idea of capitalizing on these large-scale investments that can be made simultaneously in building a community of scholars who are looking at different pieces of the element at the same time. And that uh, I think several centers, like the Center for the Study of Poverty, there are several of those in different places. Uh, there's one at Wisconsin, there's one in, at GW, I mean Georgetown in DC. So I think the center model doesn't have to be limiting, it can actually be resourceful if you can get those scholars to bring their, scholar, their, bring their attention around a core set of issues and collectively contribute to it. Yeah, I, I think the only thing I would add is that I would like to see uh, funding agencies not just be a place where we have the production of knowledge, or even new knowledge, but how it, it's now a hub for the access of that knowledge in translatable ways, and in ways or opportunities that can create meaning and opportunities for people to understand and implement that knowledge. Maybe to uh, get back to Antoinette's point about the machine learning and data, I think that's somewhere where it would be uh, good to see the funding agencies work together as well on this to make sure that we do have those conversations in the, the, the funding that comes out and maybe there's a way that the foundations can make sure that, that, that there's um, opportunities to partner with some of these projects to make sure that, that these critical components are part of are included in, in, in funding. Also I think the, the funding agencies get to set the by, by the solicitations they make, they get to the, to um, incentivize us to work on these problems. And so that's somewhere we're not just I think the, the, the agencies and the foundations have a have a role to play in, in what we do the research on. But also um, on the in thinking about how do you incentivize people to work on these problems then this, this has to be also thought about in part of promotion and, and uh, tenure in terms of how do we how do we make sure that the, the faculty see that this is an important topic that they, they should be spending time on as well. I think if it's not part of considerations for promotion and tenure, then it's going to be hard to do that because we have so many so many demands on our time to do other things. So yeah, I think um there are different, different and complementary roles that the scholars and the funding agencies hold in this space. It, it's, it's been an interesting transition to be a funder 
rather than a scholar, because what you realize is you don't get to do anything yourself. <laughs> and so what you're doing is setting the conditions for other people to do great work, which I like, I love that. I mean, I'm, I, I really enjoy that part of the work, like supporting people to do their best work. But that means some things. It means that the funding agencies actually don't have the depths of knowledge that exists with the scholars in the field, and so ensuring that we are accessing those instead of kind of going with what we might think is offhand a good idea or on, on um, so, so that being in deep consultation, I guess is my point, that funding agencies and scholars in the field need to be setting agendas and thinking about what directions research should go together. I think funding agencies has, have a responsibility around race not to fund research that does race badly, because there's a lot of that out there, and sometimes it's perfect in every other way, and there's some problematic things about how race or disadvantage is talked about, and I think it's our responsibility to, to not to fund that work. Um, and, um, and I think there's the, the other piece of complementarity there is that scholars have deep knowledge around particular topics, and funding agencies have this view across the field, and so how we bring those two together um, to craft really impactful research agendas, I think, is, is our task. All right, thank you all. Um, we have how much time? Oh, okay. So we'll take um, a few questions from you all, so uh, from the audience. So just try to keep it sort of short, so we can try to get more. Clear. But hands from anyone with questions for the panel. Everyone seems so invested. I feel so invested. <laughs> 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 okay. Dr. Um, based on this year, um, you mentioned the inequality pillar. So did you just say what the other three were? Did you say what the other three I didn't say them. I can't. Yeah. Sure. Um, asking, um, you asked me about the other initiatives. I talked about the one that they're for. So the others are developing high quality, high quality educators and leaders, so that's kind of pre-K through higher ed, thinking about university leadership, thinking about K-12 teachers and preschool teachers. Um, learning, what do we call it? Learning and thriving, there's more words in there, but the point is this kind of intersection between learning and development, how we think about de developmental science and learning science, so that we're thinking about understanding and assessing learning in ways that are broader than test scores and that take into account kind of the full range of, of human developmental capacity. And then innovative research methods. So we're thinking there around some of these big data questions that I talked about, but also qualitative literacy. What does good qualitative work look like? And might we think about what kinds of standards we're using for qualitative work and kind of what's cutting edge research methods. Hello everyone, thank you um, for your responses. Um, I guess my question would be, you know, we talked a lot about diversity and inclusion uh, and equity, and um, Dr. Span, I think it was you that mentioned, um, you know, our lived experiences are not matching the language of. So I guess how do we get to a point of what is diversity and inclusion? Because we all have very different ideas about what that is, and um, often what that does is just replicate whiteness and the status quo. So how do we get um, to this level of where we're funding and creating these equitable education spaces where we're taking in race and other things into account, uh, especially when it doesn't seem to match up with the language of diversity, or institutional diversity, I should say. It's a big one. I'm happy to start. <laughs> diversity officer at a major public <laughs> research university. Um, I mean, okay. So what we know is that the language of diversity and inclusion is the way that we talk about race and inequality in a neutral way that where we all feel comfortable. Um, so the language itself is problematic, as you implied. Um, I agree. And the presence of chief diversity officers at major universities is progress which is kind of one of the troubling things about thinking about how our work impacts the world. Things that progress is often imperfect. And how do you hold both that this is not good enough and it's better than it was? Um, I will say I think that we're, I think that the next level of movement is, is around just what you pointed out, which is 
how do we develop a common language to talk about equitable experience that doesn't center whiteness? Because um, I think that the language of diversity does does indeed do that. I think it'd be, the way I think about it is through an evolution. So at some point there was no diversity or inclusion, and we're moving in that direction. Right, we're increasing it. But now we have diversity, and they want fuller inclusion. Fuller inclusion means access to the fullest set of opportunities that are out there. But it also means equity, equality, <coughs> social justice. And so we're, we have some pockets where we've seen that, but not extensively in the greater form. I think the end result, as we keep going through that evolution, is that the value of whites are no different than the value of any other group in a space. Because we carry a value gap between uh, those who are white and those who are other. And so to continue to close that gap and to have a sense that uh, whites will value others as much as they value their own sense of self and well-being. That would be the ideal end result, but we have to keep striving in that direction. So it means that we have to have greater communication and education both sides to understand that you belong just as much and on the other side that others belong just as much as you. And so we have to continue to keep pushing and prodding that. And so the institutional developments are all good, but if it doesn't trickle down to the masses to where they're starting to live those experiences of the language that we're articulating, I think we'll, we'll, we'll run this course a long time. Um. I was an expert witness in a legal case a few years back, uh, K-12, and uh, the opposition asked me, how much of this diversity do we need in order to know that we're there? And I said, when, uh, when, a, when, an after, when, when we no longer have students who are different, experience the specter of exceptionality. Fortunately, the courts never asked me to say what that meant. <laughs> uh, but I think, uh, if you go back to uh, the reduction of prejudice work, what we need to understand is that there's no they at there. We keep thinking that there's an it. And so the it has driven how many seats we're going to mix. The it has driven any number of things that folks hope are quantitatively determined. It is about a quality of relationship that's built day by day, hour by hour. And I think we have to do the research that helps us understand what are the kinds of things we need to continue to take into consideration in order to build those kinds of communities and then try to inculcate that in every individual who comes into these kinds of communities that have all of this rich diversity. I just wanted to add. Um, I just wanted to add that the goal, and Rochelle, we're just sitting right in the audience, has written about this, right? But I use your definition all the time, which is because because the point you make in that paper was on like early two thousand. The, the point you make is that the diversity work and the equality work only makes sense when you're so far from it. <laughs> that you can, um, well, it all makes sense when you're really far from it. And then how you know you're there is when you can no longer predict by virtue of race or gender or social class or disability status or sexual orientation outcome. So you expect in any population there's a range of talents, proclivities, skill sets, but it's the ability to predict outcome by group membership that's problematic. In regards to a few of the uh, comments that was made, specifically in regards to Dr. Spann's comment about the increasing of knowledge, the need, as we do in funding, to seek the increasing of knowledge, the real capacity, the real competency. My concern is that somehow we may miss the importance of building character at the same time that we're building competency. And I think that part of the funding sources that are out there uh, could, could, could benefit from establishing as part of what they're doing this emphasis, this push on the need of, 
of character as well as competency. I think we look around us now and we see what's going on in our society. We see the importance of character at the highest echelons of our, of our government, how important that really, really is. And so I just wonder how comfortable can we be moving forward in competency, in knowledge, understanding, and never lose sight of the fact that character, a lack thereof, is what has moved us forward in the first place. Those who did not have, who felt that it was whites only, that was a lack of character. And we can't, we, we must take that in consideration deliberately as we move forward in funding uh, these particular opportunities. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know what you're talking about when it comes to the character part, man, but uh, our, our politics are doing just fine in America. <laughs> You're trying to get a brother fired. <laughs> I just think I, I think you're correct, but I think there are there are metrics that kind of help capture and understand um, kind of the values that need to be espoused to ensure that we have equity. And I think again, Dr. Nasir probably could speak just to the way Spencer thinks about those proposals that she had already articulated. Um, there are some people who do race work that, honestly, we don't want to fund that. You know, that's, they're not doing it well. Uh, it's complicated. It's, it's it maybe exacerbating problems. And so somewhere in there, there are ways that you think about how do we move things forward. Um, but I think it's also everyday people will help determine and define character. Just to use that joking example about uh, where we're at in terms of polity with our politics. Uh, it's everyday people that are now determining, you know what, we don't like where you're going with this. But it's not enough everyday people who are speaking up in this moment. And so somewhere in there, we have to think about both sides of how research is shaping it. And how people themselves are helping us understand how research should be shaped. Too much. Um, but just quickly, because I, I feel like where you're, what you're getting at is super important, which is to say that if you have a society of educated people and their education is just about the technocratic content knowledge and you're not thinking about what kind of people you're producing as a society, that's super problematic. I agree with that completely. I think that our schools have gone in this really reductive direction around what counts as good learning and what counts as productive outcomes. Um, I also think the word character is problematic for me because, it may, and I don't, I don't imply that you meant it this way, but it landed with me a certain kind of way because I think people use character sometimes to, to individualize social structures and social problems. And so part of what I think you're getting at is how do we develop uh, a citizenry that thinks in humanistic ways around what we're trying to accomplish as a society? And in that, I, I could not, um, I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. And some people have talked about this shift with respect to public education as a shift from thinking about schools as key aspects of a democratic society where you are educating the next generation to, to be the kind of society you want it to be. I mean, I think in some ways desegregation was the best example of this. I mean, it didn't happen, it didn't happen very well. But the intention was to say, if you can shift the racial, um, the racial makeup and the, the, the ways in which kids come together in schools, then you can shift the racial dynamics of society. Like, so that's kind of a long-held value about schools. We have come to a place where we think about schools more as markets, right? As places where people can come to extract resources. And that conversation around what kind of population we're creating, what kind of nation we're creating, is, is, not, um, is not on the table. And a caveat, that's always been done problematically. Education has always been trained some to be leaders and others to be workers. And so it also has to happen in a, in a, um, with a new spin <laughs> That's really deeply about equity. One more, one more question. Okay, hi, good afternoon. Um, I was wondering, you all mentioned critical race theory, critical race methodology, and how that's really important for moving this kind of research agenda forward. And I was just wondering your thoughts for how, as a field, we can continue to 
encourage and support the development of our understandings around critical race theory and methods. Uh, I think a lot of the leading scholars are kind of housed in at particular institutions, and so all of us, you know, even here we haven't had a chance to take, uh, you know, a class with Dr. Dixon, thankfully some of us have. Um, but widespread, there's not a lot of understanding about what is high quality critical race work, and so you see term, terms being misused, theories being misapplied, and so how do we continue to move that forward while trying to make sure everyone kind of knows what's meant by critical race theory and critical race method? Great question, thank you. continue to support and encourage the development of high quality critical race work within the field? Um, yeah, I think, so, you know, we have the, so we have a course on um, critical race theory and then this semester we have critical race theory and a research course. What we're endeavoring to do, we have two great postdocs um, and a new assistant professor in the School of um, Music where we try to form a group or grapple with these issues of methodology and method, and how does one, um, but it's kind of been an informal space. So we, we um, definitely borrowed from Danny Suarez, and I've talked to Danny over several years about how do you develop this longer term engagement and thinking about research. Um, and, uh, and so we've done it as an informal space. And I'm not arguing for a more formal space, because I think informal because they're interested. Um, but I do think, and, and, and we tried a few years ago with the ARA Research Conference Grant, is to um, think about um, how do we research race in education? What are the questions that we should ask? What methods will help us get at that? Um, is it possible to get it funded? Does it need to be funded research? Um, and, uh, and, and we actually tried to get a number of people from across the um, from across the spectrum. But I do think that as a school of education, um, certainly we need to have those courses kind of on the books. I've, I've taught it as a, um, as a special topics um, longer than I'm supposed to, so I'm to try to make it up <laughs> but, but I do think we need those courses and to think really critically about, um, about the, methodolo the, the methodology and not the methods, because I tell students methods are methods, but it's the kind of epistemologies that so thank you all for, for your time. Um, so in closing, I want to extend a hearty thank you to our panelists.